I want to read our passage this morning as we jump into the words. You can turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7 if you like to. I'm going to read that passage, then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to spend some time talking about the passage that I believe in God's sovereignty is what he had in store for us today as a church community. So let's read together Matthew 7, verse 1 and following, and see what the Lord has to say to us as a church this morning. Jesus' words here, he says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs lest they trample them underfoot and turn and attack you. Verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to get good how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Let's pray together. Lord, your word is powerful. It cuts to the heart of all things. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, soul and spirit, joint and marrow, The things in us that need to be cut to the heart with your word are going to be this morning. I'm convinced of that. God, by your Holy Spirit, when you speak to us and give us the things that you want us to walk away from here with today. God, may we ultimately see Jesus lifted high in these scriptures. And may we ultimately understand how our lives might change because of the words that we've heard through your word today. God, we love you. We worship you. We commit all this time to you. In Christ's great name we pray. Amen. Those are some of the most famous words that we read in the Sermon on the Mount, aren't they? The funny thing about these words that we read that are part of the Sermon on the Mount, this longer sermon in this series that we've been doing called Kingdom Manifesto, Jesus' probably most famous sermon in the New Testament. What's interesting about these words is you will hear these thrown out many, many times. Did you know that even the golden rule that we see in verse 12 is not unique to Jesus? Do you know that there's someone who even predates Jesus in a version of the golden rule that we see in texts throughout history, which is very interesting. might freak you out just a little bit. But what I find really interesting about this passage is how many people have quoted these things to us as if they are the essence of Christianity. How many of you have heard someone say, and they may not even believe the Bible is true. They may not even believe in Christianity, Jesus is bunk, whatever it is they might think. And you've heard them say at one point, oh, the Bible says don't judge, right? You've probably heard that before. You've probably heard someone just flippantly say that. Or maybe you've also heard someone say, oh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, for this is the golden rule. We can even say nice things like that in public places. It doesn't feel too offensive. But the funny thing is most people boil those two things down to what the entire gospel is. As long as you don't judge and as long as you love others like yourself, then you're a Christian. Have you heard that before? It's part of the misconception of what Christianity really is that if you do these things, then you're okay. That one day you stand before your Father in heaven and you say, man, I didn't judge other people and I kept the golden rule. I should get in, right? And Jesus says, no, you, you missed it. That's not quite what these things are aiming at. The interesting thing about the things we read today is they're a response to us knowing the goodness of God our Father. They're a response to us responding to Him in worship and surrendering our lives to Him in repentance and faith. And saying to the Lord, yes, I surrender my entire self to you. And then this is the way we live our lives. You remember Jesus told these things to his disciples. Those who were following him. The crowd who stuck around him. Who wanted to hear the words that he had to say. And he understood that they were people who needed to know what it meant to follow God. They were people who needed to know what it meant to live out the faith that they had already. And in so many ways what I'm telling you today is that this isn't the way to faith. Judging others rightly or wrongly or whatever it is and doing the golden rule is not the way to come to faith in Christ. But we'll get there in just a second. But I think so many people boil it down to these things. 
However, with that said, these things are so important for us. They're so important for us as Christians, as people who follow Jesus, as normal functioning members of society. These are important things that are applicable to us today and every single day. They speak deeply into our lives. And what I find really interesting is how deeply they speak into the events that happened this week. You think about that? I've been reflecting on these words all week long. It was very interesting how on Monday, I celebrated the 4th of July with my entire neighborhood, my block party, where we blew everything up, it seemed to be. I didn't, but the person next door who spent probably thousands of dollars on fireworks blew them all off in Bothell, and it was amazing. It was like it was a haze covering Bothell all of the 4th of July. I don't know if you saw, you walk outside, you're like, I can't breathe. You know, it was like that type of thing. But it was awesome. I'm not going to lie. I had a great time. We were just blowing stuff up all the time. My kids loved it. It was just an amazing thing. Did that whole celebration thing. Then on Tuesday, I wake up, write my sermon get my sermon prepared, ready to go. I read this passage. I'm all excited about this. Spent a good, solid chunk of the day in the Word. I was feeling refreshed and renewed. And I woke up Wednesday and the entire nation fell apart. And then Thursday, it was worse. Things were going bad and worse each and every day. And as I thought about this passage, I thought, what am I going to say on Sunday? How am I going to bring this back? And I brought back to the words that I had been studying all week. The words that in God's grace he gave me before I even got a chance to preach the words. That he knew the things that were going to happen in our nation. That nothing was surprising to him. And I woke up thinking, okay, Lord, I'm going to preach these words. Now, of course, I changed things and rearranged things. And my sermon is a lot longer than it should be today. But I'll work my best to keep it in within the parameters of what we're supposed to do. But it became one of those things that I realized there is so much to say. But I don't want to say anything more than what Jesus said himself. I don't want to say anything more than what he wants us to understand about our lives and our lives as followers of Jesus and really our lives as people in society. What does he say in these things? He says these things. He says three things. Be wary of your judgmental heart, is what he says. Be nervous about it. Be scared about your judgments that you make upon other people, is what he said. Secondly, he says God has a father heart. He cares for all people. He loves them dearly. He will give to those people who ask him the things that they need. So the second thing is God's father heart. And the third thing, which is equally important, is that you should care for others' hearts as well. So he says, I'm going to talk about the hearts today. I'm going to talk about your judgmental heart. I'm going to talk about my heart as God, the father of all things. And then I'm going to talk about how you treat others' hearts and how you care for them as well. We're going to look at these one at a time and conclude today with a call to action, I think, that will be helpful for us to walk out of here with something to do from this sermon and from the words that Jesus says to us today. So let's look at our judgmental hearts in Matthew 7, verses 1 through 6. In this passage, Jesus is warning us about our evaluation of other people, especially their actions, their thoughts, and even their motives. He's saying, be careful in your judgment of other people. How do you relate to people do you think are at fault? How do you view them in your mind? Or what do you think about people who treat you badly, personally? What do you do with those things? And how do you deal with those emotions? And Jesus says, be careful of your judgments. Jesus gives us three things in this passage on on how we are to deal with judgment. He says, first of all, judge carefully, for the same judgment you use will be used against you as well. And then secondly, he says, take that log out of your own eye before removing the speck out of your brother or sister's eye, brothers in general, their people, And then finally he says, be wise about how we try to help people, which is that really cryptic thing about not giving holy things to dogs and and not throwing your pearls to pigs, which we'll get there in just a second. He says, be careful about your judgments. Be careful about what goes on in your heart. Let me say what Jesus is not saying here before I get into what it means to judge carefully. He's not saying this, that you shouldn't under any circumstances form an opinion about something or someone else. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not saying you shouldn't use your mind and your capabilities as a person who discerns and thinks carefully about the world, that you just can't do that and you should walk around like a mindless drone. That's not what Jesus is saying. Rather, I think what Jesus is doing here is he's honing on a certain type of judgment that we as people tend to do. And it's that idea that that we as people have a new vocabulary in a sense, or that we should have a new vocabulary, that we move from this idea of judging to the idea of discerning. Maybe we become discerning people and not judging people. 
or maybe the other word that we could use instead of just judging here is maybe we don't condemn. Maybe that's a better word, which is kind of what judgment means in the context of this passage. So Jesus is not saying we can't discern. He's saying what you can't do is you can't condemn by your thoughts or by your actions. Those are the things that Jesus is confronting us on today. What Jesus really says here is if we want to heal our own hearts and those of other people's, if we want to learn together, learn to live together as friends, as neighbors, as family, if you will, we need to abandon the deeply rooted practice of human condemnation because it comes so easy to us as people. Jesus even admits it in the following verses here where he says, man, you know, you guys are hypocrites in the way you do this. And I'm not just saying this me to you. I'm saying us, all of us are hypocrites and that we all have an easy way of condemning before we understand. That's the problem we're faced with. Those are the things that Jesus is saying to us today. Now, the thing is, I think about this, and I think the best illustration of, of how we can be as people, and the way we turn into discerning and not condemning people, is I think about a dentist, all right? I'm not sure how many of you are dentists in here. I'm not sure if any of you work in teeth in here. No, don't, don't raise your hand. We'll hate you, but i um, just kidding. Um, but the dentist thing is really interesting because if you think about the dentist, you go to the dentist and you run in there and you kind of do your thing and you, the dentist comes in and looks at your teeth and they may say to you, hey, I see you've not been brushing regularly. How many of you have heard that, right? I, I'm just saying. I see you've not been brushing regularly. You're not flossing either. Your gums are receding and there's a cavity on your lower right side that we need to take care of you, all right? How many of you look at the judge, dentist and say, stop judging me, right? We don't do that, do we? It's not the way we function as people. He's simply telling us the things that are going on in life. He's not condemning us. Well, maybe some dentists are. I actually didn't go to the dentist for a long time. I lived in Australia for a couple years, didn't have any insurance. Came back, finally went to the dentist. I swear my dentist was working on my teeth so hard. He was like angry at me. He's like, ah! And I'm like, sorry, man, I didn't mean to, you know? Maybe some dentists are like that, but I'm guessing most dentists aren't. They're not judging you. They're not condemning you. They're telling you the facts about what your teeth are like. That's the difference between judging and discerning, if you will, and condemning. What Jesus is saying is don't be the type of people that look at someone and say, man, your teeth are so ugly. I can't believe that. Don't be that type of person. The Lord Jesus is reminding us here we need to be careful about being too harsh and severe in the judgments we make. The Lord reminds us in our assessments of others, in our evaluation of others, we must be on guard at all times to evaluate in a way that leads to condemnation, in a way that says, I am better or they're doing things wrong. That's the interesting thing about the way Jesus talks about judgments here. Moreover, if you look at Jesus' words at the end of verse 2, they become exceedingly scary. Because he says, by the standard you use to measure against other people, that standard will be measured against you as well. If anything should strike fear into your own hearts, it's that. Because how many times have we condemned someone to turn around and find ourselves doing the same thing? Whether it's a couple hours later, or a few days later, or weeks later. There's a certain gravity to the things that Jesus is saying. So it's not that you can't be discerning, think carefully and critically about things. It's that you need to be careful about the condemnation that you use in your mind towards other people and their actions, their motives, and their hearts. Lord Jesus is going to tell a parable one day soon in Matthew 18. That parable is a man about a man who owes a king a great deal of money. And the king forgives him this great deal of money because he comes and asks him to forgive him this money. And this, this servant turns around and he realizes that all these people owe him money as well. And so he goes up to one of these men who owes him a little bit of money and says to him, give me the money you owe me. And the man says, I don't, I don't have it. I can't pay you. And so the man has this man thrown in jail. The king hears about it. What does the king do? He says, I'm going to take that man. I'm going to throw him in jail forever because he is judging someone else. His actions are condemning another person. Like the interesting thing about the thing Jesus does here is says, don't be that guy. Don't be the guy who knows that, that you cannot be a person who can't receive the grace of God. Don't be a person who thinks that you are better than other people and that they owe you something more than anything else and that you are more important than they are. These words become so applicable to us as people. What I would say is there's a little pithy saying that you can remember for judging other people here, and it's a general thing to say. It's kind of an axiom. It's not always true, but many times it's true, and it's this. If you're not on the jury... Don't consider yourself responsibility, responsible to reach a verdict. All right? This is the way you can think about in terms of your judgment. 
If you're not sitting on the jury, if you're not the person who's directly in charge of making the judgment, then don't consider it your responsibility to reach a verdict. It's a good pithy saying to remember in terms of how we judge other people. It's not your judgment to make, don't make the judgment. And I'm talking about judgments that are really none of our business when it comes down to it. We may have opinions which are our opinions, but we may not impose them as law on the rest of the people around us. We have to be careful in the way we do that. Moreover, and I can't jump into this one, this is something I talked about more in my sermon before I rewrote it a little bit this weekend, that is we have so many times have to differentiate between our personal preferences and scriptural commands. It's so important to do that in the way we judge other people. What is scriptural? What is most important? And what is just our preference? Because I think by default, most of us go just to preferences and we place our judgments on people based on our preferences. And it's a scary place to get in because it leads to condemnation and not to restoration. Honestly, there's places in Scripture that talk about us helping people to come back from sin, to help them in, we've got to make a judgment at some point. Galatians 6 is a place like this, where we make a judgment if someone stumbles, if a brother stumbles, you can carefully and wisely and gently, the Bible says, gently bring them back into restoration. But the funny thing is, is it doesn't tell us just to sit back and condemn them for all the things they're doing, but to help in the process. The illustration then that Jesus gives is really interesting about this. He says something about what happens to those of us who become not discerning people, but condemning people. He says, there's something about you, and it's this. Got a log in your eye, is what he says. And the funny thing about this is, when you think about a person who has a log in their eye, as I get a splinter in my eye, that, that helped. Um, that's a great illustration. That's what it says there as well. The funny thing about this is when Jesus says, you're a person who has a log in their eye. You're a person who's condemning of other people. That's the picture he's given. You don't even see the thing that you have sticking out of your face that everyone else does that looks strange. And the funny thing is the illustration is supposed to make us laugh. When I read this, I heard a few people giggling. It was supposed to make us laugh because it's just crazy. It's just dumb looking right, to see someone with a log sticking out of their eye. But I think that's the point of this. It, it, Jesus is saying, you're, you're being dumb if you make a condemna- con- condemning statement towards another person without even realizing the pain that you have in your own life, without even realizing the brokenness you have in life, without even realizing some of the presuppositions you have in your own life. The funny thing is, I love this illustration that Jesus gives because I, I think the idea is that most of us don't even know we have this. I think people walk around and just they notice all the other things that other people have and they don't even realize that they have this sticking out of their eye as well. And I think that's the point of what Jesus is trying to make. He's saying there's things in you you don't even understand when you make judgments. You don't even realize you might even be condemning yourself because you might even have those same things in your life. Jesus is saying you might have blind spots even with your best intentions. So don't pull the specks out of other people's eyes. Work on getting rid of that big log in your own eye first. The illustration that Jesus gives makes me think about a lot of things that happened this week. Makes me think about what our nation has been going through. I mean, I wonder if we have presuppositions or predispositions that have influenced our opinion about things that are going on in our nation. I wonder if we have kind of logs in our eye and that we can easily sit back on Facebook or social media or whatever and complain about the things that are happening in the world or, or form an opinion about things that we may not have an idea about. We may not even have all the answers. Maybe we have predispositions that we don't even know about as people. We don't even understand. For example, maybe there's sin in your life that is blocking you to have a real neutral stance on anything at all. Could that be? Could there be some sort of blind spot there? Could it be that if you watch Fox News all the time, you should probably mix in a little CNN or MSNBC at some point because it gives you maybe a blind spot? Could it be that because I'm white, I can say this, all right? Because I'm white, I can say this. That, that I am ethnically white and I might not believe in white privilege because I don't even know about it because I have it? Could it be? I, I don't know. I'm just saying. I'm just saying I'm, I want to be careful with pulling the log out of my own eye before I start to pick on other people who are out there. Could it be that the phrase Black Lives Matters means something to people that we don't understand because we have a certain cultural context that we quick to judge other people and yet we don't understand the shoes that they walk in? I thought about this week and I thought how quick I am to judge. How quick I am to think about things. 
Maybe it's easy to sit back and say, man, those police should have never shot those people all the way. You know, it was horrible, whatever it is. We don't know the context of some of those things. We see these videos and we feel the pain of those things and we admit they look horrible, don't they? As I watched those things, I grieved. I wept as I watched the second killing. And I watched that and I thought, man, this is so painful. And yet I don't know everything that's going on. I don't know. I need to pull the log out of my own eye before I quick to judge other people. Maybe we've become conditioned in some way to be nervous around personal safety or on certain ethnic minorities. We don't even know it. Maybe when we know that, maybe we need to know that when we say things like all lives matter, in response to saying someone saying black lives matter, you might actually be be saying something perceived as racist even though you don't know it. Maybe your heart's okay in saying all lives matter that maybe you don't realize the culture of Black Lives Matter and how important it is to them to say that. As one thing I saw on Facebook this week, just because you say save the rainforest doesn't mean you're saying I hate all the other forests out there. Right? Be careful. Be careful in your judgments. Be careful about the things we say. There's so much in so many ways these words can hit to the heart of the matter. Jesus is saying even with your best intentions, you may become people who have blind spots and you may be people who have blind spots. I think it's Jesus is not being quick to condemn us as people for having a log in our eye. I think he's just simply recognizing it. He recognizes in the next verse you see here, I mean, he says, you know, there is a log. You, you have a log in your eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye. He's noticing that it's just part of the human experience to have presuppositions. He's noticing that we see things from a cultural worldview that we understand. And I think that's what Jesus is saying. Just be careful about those things. Be careful about the way you view things and, and your certain point of view doesn't become gospel truth to everyone else. Be willing to listen. Be willing to indeed take that log out of your own eye before you take the speck out of others. I think the last thing Jesus says about this is really important too, and that's that idea of being wise about the way you help other people as well. And this is that, like I said, that cryptic saying, do not give dogs sacred things to eat. Don't try to get pigs to dine in the pearls. They will simply turn and attack you. Many people have taken this in the past as simply a response to the gospel message. Some commentators say that, that this is said here, that the idea is that Jesus is trying to get people that are not going to respond to the gospel message, that you just kind of turn away and leave them alone. But I can't think of anything further from the heart of God's message to people than to just not tell someone the gospel because they might reject it. After all, that's what he did to me who rejected it many times before I responded to it. I I don't see this being that. What I see this as being simply, you're not giving the animal something helpful. You notice that? Like, if you give a dog something holy, that's not helpful. If you give a pearl pigs, or if you give a pig pearls, that's not that helpful either. They'll turn and attack you or turn and eat you, is the idea behind this. In fact, Dallas Willard in his commentary says something really funny. The reason these animals will finally turn and attack you when, when you step up and give them a load of pearls is that at least you are edible, is what he says about this. The thing is, you're not giving someone something helpful. And I think maybe our thoughts is we are giving them something helpful. Man, I'm giving this dog something holy. Man, I'm giving this pig pearls. Everyone wants pearls. When the pig's just going, I just want something to eat. That's all I want. That's the idea behind this. What if this picture is be careful about the way you try to help people. Be careful about the things that you do. Our pearls are often come with a certain superiority that keeps us from paying attention to those we're trying to even help. As we talk to Africa New Life, our ministry partners in Bujasera, Rwanda, and are so grateful for them, they have told us time and time again, you can't just throw money at us. It doesn't help. You have to show up and help us. You can't just be here and take part in the ministry without actually investing in it for years and years. This isn't just a, a tourist trip to go see what's going on there. The truth of the matter is we need to be willing to invest and to be there and to use our helps in the right way and maybe even ask the question of how my helps can help that person. Let me come back to the events of this week again and say a few more words about them. I imagine Finlandro Castile waking up on Wednesday to the news of Alton Sterling being pinned down and shot at point blank range. I imagine him thinking to himself, that could have been me, not realizing in a few hours he'd be live streamed on Facebook before the world and he'd become a hashtag on social media and the next story on the national news. I imagine the police officers in Dallas waking up Thursday, putting on their badges and their blue uniforms and 
getting ready to go serve and help and care and do everything they can to protect, not realizing this very same time citizens who they were sworn to protect and serve were getting ready for a homegrown terrorist attack upon them. I imagine they didn't realize that. The coming days and weeks are going to be filled with heated reaction to these events from politicians, from protesters, from pundits, and normal people like you and me, who have our opinions about various things. But beyond the shouting matches and the airwaves that we're going to hear and the things that go on, what is our response? What should we do? If we're going to take the words of Jesus here, we recognize that we have judgments and preconceived ideas ourselves. We recognize that we have to be wary of our judgmental hearts and judge carefully. Remove those presuppositions out of our eye. Work hard to get rid of this before we start pointing out all the failures of other people as well. Recognize that we don't cast our pearls in a careless way. In other words, we begin with compassion. We weep with those who weep, Romans 12, 15. No matter our race or our background, we lament the lives made in the image of God and the likeness of God who have been suddenly and endlessly ended. We grieve for the mothers who lost sons and the children who lost fathers. We refuse to give credence to those who demand a quote of a victim's criminal rap sheet because how ridiculous is that? How ridiculous is that? As if that somehow justifies public execution. We reject voices that would call for anarchy and war, knowing that violence and chaos only makes oppression worse and never better. We do not entertain simplistic solutions to complex ideas and problems woven deeply in our communities and our histories. We determine not to be led by our worst fears. Instead, we commit to stand together as a people. We commit to be committed to other people who may not be similar to us. President Obama's speech, no matter what you think of them, was very well said. He said, when people say black lives matter, that doesn't mean that blue lives matter. Both can handle each in the same time. We acknowledge we are not wrestling with flesh and blood. And against only physical enemies, we see this in Ephesians 6, there is a spiritual thing going on in our nation as well. The Bible culminates in Ephesians 2 with the Lord Jesus who broke down the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile. You know, one of the goals of the gospel and him dying on the cross was to break up race interpersonal crisis and to make relations people different, Jew and Gentile, black and white, uh, Asian and whatever, all together as one people. That was one of the goals of the actual death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see that in Ephesians chapter 2. We remember even that we worship a God who knows firsthand what it means to publicly and unjustly be murdered. Luke 24. We pray for grace. We pray for justice. We pray for wisdom and direction moving forward. We examine our own hearts before the Holy Spirit. We ask the Lord if we've been co-conspirators in forming a culture of hatred, division, and systemic injustice. We recognize and repent of our own temptation towards bitterness and bias, and we plead for mercy on ourselves and upon our broken world. Psalm 51 is a great place to start with that, and other psalms lament that we kicked off our gathering this morning. We recognize that racism isn't just an individual sin, but a social evil as well, and we condemn it anytime we can as Christians. We understand that racial division is an affront against the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom he represented, where one day all peoples of all races, of all tribes and tongues and nations will stand before the Father and be seen as the same, as one people, brothers and sisters, before a king who set up a kingdom that we can worship together, hand in hand, arm in arm, as one people. What a beautiful picture we see in Revelation. We strive to be quick to hear and slow to speak, slow to anger, We know that the anger of man and women does not bring about the righteousness that God desires. We seek to live in harmony one with another. We put down haughtiness and associate with the lowly. We refuse to be wise in our own sight, as Romans 12 tells us. We commit to forgive those who don't deserve to be forgiven. We commit to forsake our pride and ask for forgiveness when we don't deserve it either. We proactively pursue friendship and break bread with people who are different than us when it isn't easy or when it isn't convenient. We look for opportunities to contribute. We love those who should be our enemies as well because God first loved us when we were his enemies, 1 John 4 tells us. The truth of the matter is so many things we can do, but the first thing we tend to do is we tend to condemn. And all I'm telling you today is it's this. It's the picture we get. It's the picture of the thing that God wants us not to do. And the first thing we need to do is remove this thing. And say, okay, Lord, Start with me. Start with me. Would you rearrange my own heart? 
Would you help me see some of the things that I value that I shouldn't value? Would you help me see things from another person's point of view that I don't understand? A culture that I don't get. A culture that I'm not part of, that I may think is dumb or prone to violence or whatever you might say. Those judgment calls are things that God wants us to be very, very careful about. And then remember that in the end, we remember that God is setting up that kingdom. That kingdom where one day He will be the one who reigns forever, victoriously. The one who brings all people together and builds a kingdom of priests and a holy nation out of all people, all races, all backgrounds. And my hope for that is the church starts to reflect that today as much as possible. I understand that Woodenville is mostly white and Asian. I get that. And I get that we may not have a lot of chance to run into people from other backgrounds, cultural, African-American people, or whatever it is. I know that we have many Indian people. We have many people from different backgrounds. What I'm telling you is that we need to be a church, a community that strives and works hard to understand, to love one another, to work together, to build a community that looks like heaven. That's my hope for us. My hope for us is to have a church that looks distinct because it's racially connected by many different peoples from many different color skins, many different backgrounds, even many different points of view. And my hope would be that we wouldn't be a church that judges that, but we'd be a church that celebrates that, that hopes for that, that desires that as a community. So we diligently give ourselves as a church community to be a preview for the world to see what it looks like to get along one to another. My hope for us is that we understand this and we work hard for these things. The interesting thing is, as we work through the rest of the passage and finish this up really quick here, is that we see in verse 7 through 10, I find it not at all interesting how God refers to himself as a good father in this part. As he starts talking about these random things about judging one another and being careful in our judgment towards one another and removing that log out of our eye, he says, look, I'm the father of all people. I'm the Father who if you ask, if you seek, if you do these things, that I will give good things to those who need them. I love how he takes the Father heart of God in this conversation and says, hey, you know, God has a Father heart. He's not too busy to care for our needs. He designed us to bring our needs to Him. He designed us as people to be one people under His authority. Throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus set up the stringent standards for His disciples but he also went to great lengths to show them that he was their father and that we as one father could look different as a people. And this leads us to that famous golden rule. And that's the idea of caring for others' hearts in 7.12. As I close today, this is the action step I have for you. This is the action step that we have as people to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. To step in another person's shoes as best as we can This verse is very famous to all of us. We all know it, I think, and we've seen it many times. And I think that everyone thinks the golden rule is a great idea, but putting it into practice is the super hard part. Think about your most difficult relationships. Think about the people you don't normally hang with. Think about those areas of your life where that person has offended you so many times that you're not sure that you could ever fix that in any way, shape, or form. The hard part is applying the golden rule to that moment. To say, okay, I want to do unto them as I would wish them to do unto me. The interesting thing is followers of Jesus understand that the right thing to do comes first from a right view of God and then a right view of ourselves. That we do this as people because we respond to the grace of God. I said at the beginning of this thing as I close this morning, I said at the beginning of my sermon that the golden rule and judge not is not the gospel. The gospel is this, that Jesus Christ gave his life for us to make us one people. He came as a man humbly to set aside his rights, to set aside for a time his judgment upon his sins, upon the sins of all people, set aside for a time, to ultimately bring us into a right relationship with God and to make us one people. And the gospel is this, that you trust in that by faith, that you repent of your sins and that you come before the Lord and say, God, I am a sinner broken in need of grace. And therefore, I need you to redeem me. I need you to sanctify me. And what happens in that moment, he changes our hearts. He gives us the ability to do the golden rule. Do you know the golden rule is impossible without the love and grace of Jesus working on your heart first? It is impossible. But it makes it possible when you become a person who follows Christ and says, I, I want to I be his. 
I want to be his son. I want to be his daughter. I want to follow him and do the things he's asking me to do. And in that moment, he miraculously, through the Holy Spirit, gives you the desire and the ability to be a person who is different and does unto others as you would want them to do unto you. But the golden rule is not the gospel. If you want to be a Christian today, you have to respond to Jesus. The idea that he saved us and brought us into a relationship with him. And then he helps you live out that golden rule. That's how we do not despair about things like this. And we realize that we can take out our log out of our eye because God is a good father who cares for us and loves us and wants us to live this out one to another. We're going to respond to the Lord this morning. There's a lot of things that I said that are full of tension. (laughs) A lot of things I said that are full of emotion and pain. And I understand what, I guess the thing I would ask is that you be gracious in a place like this. To think about your own heart first. To think about what God wants to do in you. The miracle he wants to do in you. And not just those out there. And what he wants to do to transform you as a person that could look differently. Because who knows? Who knows what your experience will be? Who knows who God will place in your path to be friends with, to express the gospel to, to express God's father heart to, or even do the golden rule to? Who knows what God might do in that? You have an option at that point to condemn, to judge, or to openly and helpfully care for them and love them and listen to them and do everything to be people who are like Jesus wants us to be. We're going to come before God in response As we do this, we're going to sing some songs this morning. We're going to worship the Lord. I would encourage you to think, to pray, think about the things that we sing, and worship with us. Thank Jesus for what he's done for us in making us a people of his own possession. He's called out of darkness into his light. Ultimately, we're going to come and take communion. On both tables up on the sides, you can come and receive communion. There's a gluten-free option on this table over here. You can come and dip that that bread in the cup and receive that by faith, thanking the Lord for what he's done in making you his own daughter or son. Thank the Lord that he broke down the dividing wall of hostility between you and him and ultimately made you his follower. You can do that when you come to communion. There's giving baskets on both tables as well. If you give, we're so grateful and you can come and give at any point during our time. And we're so thankful for your gifts as we do ministry here. And we're thankful for how you support that ministry and are part of the church as well. And finally, you can pray. Maybe it's time just to reflect a little bit on, on this thing, on the log that we have in our own eyes, and just be careful of how we judge and what it looks like when we judge, and to be wise about that, and to be discerning and not condemning about things, and to put ourselves in other people's shoes who we may not understand completely, and that we may need to work hard to understand before we make a judgment call about us. And that means we do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Let me pray about these things. God, thank you so much for your word, full of emotion and passion today, full of difficulty as well. As we think about our own lives and what it means to be people that are called brothers and sisters, as as we think about the things that have happened in our world and we grieve over them, we hurt over them, and yet we also have to ask ourselves, are we part of the problem? Do we have things in our life where we don't understand that we need you to work on in us? And if there are God, the good news is you're a good father and that you want to work on those for us. You want to remove that log out of our eye. And that's a desire of yours and we're so grateful for that this morning. God, would you do that for us? God, would you help us to be part of the healing of the nations, Lord? Would you help us to be a people that look differently here so that the world can look in and say, man, I want that. That's what racial reconciliation looks like. That's what it looks like not to judge one another. That's what it looks like to live under the Father heart of God and ultimately what it means to love one another as we wish to be loved. God, we're thankful for your words. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.